Every two years in early October, automotive enthusiasts from the world over descend on Paris as car makers show off their latest creations. Mercedes-Benz couldn't wait until the fair's official opening day to present the AMG GT Roadster. The open top two-seater puts out some 410 kilowatts. At the fair itself, Mercedes promoted its upcoming generation EQ line, a range of electric SUV coupes. The concept car on display here has a range of 500 kilometers. It's something of a sneak preview of what Mercedes calls the electric intelligence range. Meanwhile, an electric convertible edition of the Smart will hit showroom floors as early as spring 2017. Opel also had a bolt of electric power on show. The new Ampera E, likewise, has an official range estimate of 500 kilometers. With 150 kilowatts, it makes the dash from 0 to 50 kilometers per hour in just 3.2 seconds. We've made major investments in a new battery and developed the entire car around it. We intend to make a great many more products based on this technology. Porsche was in town to unveil the Panamera 4 e-Hybrid. The ultra-efficient version consumes only two and a half liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. This car has amazing acceleration at a top speed of 280 kilometers per hour. It also has an electric range of 50 kilometers in the city. Proactive planning in the development of the second Panamera generation allowed Porsche to integrate the additional engineering needed for the plug-in hybrid without problems. Among the real stunners in Paris was Hyundai's RN30. The concept is based on the i30 and has its roots in motorsports. Hyundai wants to make these high-performance engines available to its customers. They now have 380 horsepower. The production version will likely have a bit less. We want to offer customers just under 300 horsepower in an i30 and later in other products. The i30 is Hyundai's best-selling model right now. In Paris, the carmaker showed off the third generation featuring a new 1.4-liter turbo gasoline engine with 103 kilowatts. Nissan presented the fifth generation of the Micra. For 30 years now, the city car has been delighting drivers across the planet. We've sold 7 million units, half of them in Europe. And now we have something the segment hasn't seen before. Three functions, the around view monitor, headrest speakers for perfect acoustics, and an active lane keep assist. The new Micra is set to hit the streets next spring. Audi made quite an entrance with a new sedan edition of the RS3. Things have also changed for Audi's most popular model, the Q5. The new generation comes with optional adjustive air suspension and optimized engines. The new Q5 is up to 65 kilos lighter than its predecessor. Seat wowed the crowds with an all-new stand concept. 4D goggles and moving seats keep all your senses busy for an unforgettable visitor experience. One model here at Seat took center stage, the Ateca Experience. It's an SUV that prefers urban environments, but this new take makes it even more ready to rumble off-road. Skoda brought along its latest baby, the distinctive-looking Kodiak. The subtle contouring combines well with the robust overall look. The 2-meter 79 wheelbase is the longest in its class and translates into above-average interior space. The Kodiak goes on sale in March 2017. List prices in Germany start at 25,500 euros. The Lexus Kinetic seat concept also celebrated its world premiere. It involves a fiber net construction similar to a spider's web and can adapt to the driver's body shapes. 
It's featured in the UX with its futuristic inside-out design. The SUV concept was created at Lexus's European Design Center in the south of France. Nine years after the last Ignis, Suzuki showcased the new generation in the French capital. The subcompact has impressive functionality. An optional powertrain by the name of Smart Hybrid Vehicle by Suzuki, or SHVS, promises to make the pint-sized crossover even more fuel efficient. The FCV Plus by Toyota reportedly has three functions. It generates electricity from water to power itself. It can also charge up other electric vehicles by transferring its power to other cars via the local power grid. Plus, the fuel cell can be removed and used elsewhere to generate power. We have in-wheel motors on all four wheels. That means all-wheel drive, but also a very compact vehicle with an enormous interior. It shows that it's possible for a fuel cell to give even a small car a long range. Energy consumer turned energy supplier. Over the next nine years, Volkswagen plans to build over 30 new electric models as part of its strategy 2025. Giving visitors in Paris an idea of what to expect was the 125 kilowatt ID with an official range of 600 kilometers on electric power. And it's charged inductively without any cables. The new architecture also changed the inside dimensions. The exterior proportions of a Golf with an interior the size of a new Passat. Price-wise, it's around the same as a contemporary diesel, so electromobility will prevail. Following in the tire tracks of the Beetle and Golf, Volkswagen envisages the ID as the epitome of future mobility. It might take some time until we have only electric cars on the streets, but VW is fully aware of that. Car tester Sasha Knopp explains that even if Jaguar hails from a long sporting tradition, it still has to keep pace with today's market. The F-Type tried to contend with a Porsche. The F-Pace takes on the SUV segment, and the Jaguar XE claims the midsize niche. The previous generation, the X-Type, may have been little more than a spiffed-up Mondeo, but the XE has now come into its own. The modified Ford platform for the last generation has been retired. The new XE is built on Land Rover's modular architecture. The lightweight construction makes for a body shell of only 251 kilos. The sedan's roofline still expresses Jaguar design, sweeping back like a coupe. We tested the XE with the 2-liter four-cylinder turbocharged diesel putting out 132 kilowatts of power, the only engine offered with all-wheel drive. The top trim R-Sport branding accents the dynamic side of the British model. It can hold its own with Audi's A4, BMW's 3 Series, and Mercedes C-Class. The engine has all but lost the tick-tocking diesel sound, and AdBlue exhaust treatment helps it meet the Euro 6 emission standard. The all-wheel drive version leaps from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 7.9 seconds, reaching a maximum speed of 225 kilometers per hour. The torque vectoring enhances the sporty feel, especially in tight curves, breaking the inside wheels independently of each other and increasing stability, even for abrupt turns. Sasha observes that the Jaguar XE is built as a sport sedan and it drives like one. The suspension is properly sporting without being too stiff, but the electric power steering is just a bit soft. On that point, its German competitors are nippier. Included in the XE's package of active driver assistance technologies are a lane keep assist, 
and a driver condition monitor for added safety on long hauls. An automatic emergency braking system supports the adaptive cruise control. Closing vehicle sensing and park assist also help make the driver's life easier. Sasha points out that the closing vehicle sensing is set very differently from its counterparts and competitors' vehicles. It kicks in much earlier, so at first it's not quite clear what all the beeping's about. If it approaches another car a bit too rapidly, it gives a warning immediately. Or, if, for example, a vehicle is parked on the shoulder in a curve, it spots it immediately as a potential obstacle. Its German competitors warn the driver much later, but, much as with the adaptive cruise control, he'd rather have the option to set the distance himself. Mercedes beeps too late for his taste and Jaguar too soon. If he could set the distance himself, it would be ideal. The XE may be the lowest priced Jaguar available, but it makes no compromises on the interior. The R Sport version is appropriately elegant and dignified without going too far. It includes such typical Jaguar features as the booting up of the instruments when starting. At the press of a button, the shift lever for the 8-speed automatic transmission rises from the center console. The driving modes provide options for more dynamic or more fuel-efficient styles. Sasha is reminded that the Jaguar XE is mid-sized by the rear seats. He can see that there's not much legroom available in back, though it may be enough for passengers who are not as tall and big-boned as he is. But he sees the front seat backs made of hard plastic as a big minus. He's convinced there must be a more comfortable solution for the rider's knees when they're jammed in. Here, too, the German competitors are only marginally better. Aber auch hier nochmal gesagt, die deutschen Mitbewerber können das auch nur sehr bedingt besser. In the back, the Jaguar XE can open wide. With a total of 455 liters, it has more cargo space than an Audi A4 or a BMW 3 Series. Still, he believes the Jaguar XE will not have an easy time of it in Germany, with the midsize segment well covered by German car makers. Audi, BMW and Mercedes have long since divided up the midsize pie. But the XE would definitely be a good choice for car buyers looking for a more individual set of wheels. In Germany, this entry-level Jag starts at 36,450 euros low enough to inspire more than a few to become owners of this big cat. Our car tester Manuel Schaefer says the Golf GTI is the quintessential compact sports car. Naturally, other manufacturers want to compete in this segment as well. A good example is Kia's CGT. In Germany, the CGT is available as a three-door or five-door model. The three-door model is called Pro CGT, but both models come with the same engine. Emanuel says the Kia CGT comes with a 1.6-liter turbo engine with an output of 150 kilowatts or 204 horsepower. And you can really feel that power when you step on the gas. The 1.6-liter direct-injection gasoline engine has a newly developed twin-scroll turbocharger. This gets you from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in 7.6 seconds and produces a top speed of 230 kilometers per hour. Emanuel says if you hit this button with the GT logo on the steering wheel, You'll hear sound of the exhaust change to a deep, loud roar. 
The button also shows the rev on the left of the display and turbocharger pressure on the right. It's supposed to change the throttle response too, but Emmanuel can't really tell. Sich verändern soll, also die Kennlinie. Ich muss allerdings ehrlich sagen, davon merke ich relativ wenig. But it's still plenty of fun to ride this little racer along windy country roads. The CGT's exterior has a distinctive sporty look. The four-point LED daytime running lights and Kia's typical tiger nose radiator grille in a GTS design make it instantly recognizable. At the rear, there's a dual exhaust system and a chrome GT logo, plus a roof spoiler with a third brake light. The trunk has a capacity of between 380 and 1,318 liters. Folding back the rear seats gives you an almost flat surface. The interior has lots of buttons, mainly for the air conditioning. The gear knob looks similar to that of the GTI. And Recaro Sport seats with a GT logo are standard. And back on the road, you can instantly tell what these seats were designed for. At high speeds, they support the passengers well without cramping them. All GT versions, like all seed models, are manufactured in Selina in Slovakia at Kia's European production site. And like every European Kia car, this GT comes with a seven-year warranty. Manuel says the CGT is really fun to drive, even though it can't quite keep up with the more powerful Golf GTI and similar cars. But the entry-level CGT is available for just under 25,000 euros. That's 5,000 euros less than the Golf GTI. The CGT is available in two equipment lines, GT Challenge and GT Track. The latter comes with Xenon headlamps, adaptive curve following front lighting, and a digital DAB radio. This upgrade costs 3,000 euros and is well worth considering. One of the pioneers of aerodynamics is put to the test, the Tatra 87. The brand Tatra ranks among the world's oldest automobile manufacturers. It began producing motor cars as early as 1897 in Kovšenica, in what's now the Czech Republic. Our car tester Christoph Bauer explains that the first cars to come out of Kovševnica still carry the name Nesseldorf. That's what the town was called before World War I when it still belonged to Austria-Hungary. And Kovševnica is also the only town, as far as he's aware, to have a car in its coat of arms, proving just how important the industry was for the region. In 1920, the company changed its name to Tatra, after the highest mountain in former Czechoslovakia. The Austrian car maker Hans Vedvinka and his team created truly revolutionary designs. And Christoph also mentions the streamlined shape, the brand's most iconic feature, and a brand new concept back then. The first streamlining experiments began in the 1920s. A new teardrop-shaped body was used to minimize air resistance, maximize speed, and reduce fuel consumption. And on a diverse range of different vehicles, including airships, aircrafts, trains, and of course, cars. Christoph explains that the Tatra 87 and its direct predecessor, the 77, were some of the world's first vehicles to be developed in a wind tunnel. The engineers enlisted Hungarian Zeppelin builder Paul Jarai for help. Christoph says the most successful product of their ambitious research was arguably this car, the Tatra 87, presented in 1936 with a drag coefficient of just 0.36. And that's still very impressive today. A 
A modest 75 horsepower is still enough to accelerate the Tatra 87 to over 150 kilometers per hour, with a recommended cruising speed of 135. In the 1930s, the Tatra was one of the world's fastest series produced vehicles. Christoph recommends taking your foot off the gas to really experience how streamlined the car is. It just carries on rolling, totally unaffected by the wind. And of course, less air resistance means less fuel consumption. This car uses just 12.2 liters per 100 kilometers. Most cars of a similar performance would get through twice that. Christoph would say it's a cross between a luxury sedan and a super sports car. And a miracle of fuel consumption, which nowadays, he says, is a real rarity. In the interior, too, he's surrounded by pure luxury, leather as far as the eye can see. And this Art Deco-style cockpit has so many buttons, no owner could possibly know what they'll all do. Pure opulence. He also mentions the fantastic streamlining with a giant tail fin attached in the center. It's supposed to provide a smoother drive at high speeds. You might have noticed its similarity to the VW Beetle, says Christoph, and that's not just a coincidence. The builder Hans Ledwinka was good friends with Ferdinand Porsche, the father of Volkswagen. So who stole whose idea? Well, it's certainly a bone of contention, and Christoph staying well out of it. The front section with its three headlights is one of the most striking features of the Tatra 87, along with its enormous air scoop to ventilate the rear engine and its unique silhouette with covered aerodynamic rear wheels. The manufacturing is without a doubt first rate, but there's one very odd design flaw. The trunk is only accessible from the inside. But still, the Tatra 87 is an undisputed gem of pre-war automotive design, a true work of art. Christoph explains that in this Tatra, the engine isn't fitted at the front, but under a gigantic hood at the back. It's an air-cooled V8 engine with a 3-liter displacement overhead camshafts and 75 horsepower. The engine block and transmission case are made from Electron, a super lightweight magnesium alloy which reduces the car's weight to just 1,370 kilograms. The four-speed gearbox with unsynchronized first and second gears does take some getting used to. And it is prone to crunch a bit. The view out the back is terrible. The double windshield and the fins on the hood restrict the view. So what goes on behind the car really is anyone's guess. But the Tatra is reliable. Czech adventurers Jiri Hanselka and Miroslav Zygmunt successfully traveled the world in the T-87 between 1947 and 1950. To sum up, Christoph would call this a groundbreaking car that, at the time, was light years ahead of the competition. But it was an elusive beauty. Production was put on hold in 1939 because of the Second World War. Manufacturing resumed and continued into the 1950s, but only 3,023 models were ever built. Still, to this day, it's the only series-produced sedan built in a wind tunnel using aerodynamic research. He would definitely call it a milestone in automotive history. Insofern ist der Tatra 87 definitiv ein Meilenstein der Automobilgeschichte. Today Tatra only makes trucks, so unfortunately history it is.